I am here with Dr. Gleb Sipersky, known as the disaster avoidance expert. He's passionate about promoting science-based decision-making and emotional and social intelligence to help leaders, organizations, and our society avoid disasters. He researches these topics as a professor at The Ohio State University, and he's a civic activist. He serves as a volunteer president of a nonprofit uh, devoted to popularizing the research on these topics, Intentional Insights. Uh, I want to make sure I've got this right. Businesses, nonprofits, and municipalities frequently hire you, right? As a consultant and speaker. He's That's right. Yeah, he's authored a number of books, most notably Amazon's bestsellers, The Truth Seeker's Handbook, A Science-Based Guide, and Find Your Purpose Using Science. And now you're working on The Secrets of Avoiding Disasters, A Science-Based Guide for Leaders and Organizations. Welcome, Bob. Thank you so much for having me on, Diane. It's a pleasure once again. Well, it's fun to talk to you again. You've been on my radio show, and we thought we'd expand this because you're an interesting guy, and you're interesting um, to me, especially because of all the things that I study are similar to the kind of things that you study, emotional yeah. intelligence and all of that. And I was interested in something that you sent me. You said that more than a fifth of CEOs get fired because they deny reality. Can, mm -hmm. uh, can we start with that? I want to know what you sure. mean by that and what do you mean, what kind of de uh, denying of reality are they doing? Sure. So there was a study, four-year study by Leadership IQ, which found that of all CEOs who were fired, one-fifth were fired for denying reality, which they meant, and the definition of that is that they denied negative facts about the organization's performance. They ignored those facts. They didn't face up to them. Now, the boards who forced them out, and this was a study of interviews with board members who forced out CEOs. And so the board members said that, you know, that it's not, it, the problem wasn't that the CEOs were underperforming. The problem was that they weren't acknowledging this organization's underperformance. They weren't willing to take a square, honest look at what's going on and turn around the ship of the organization. So that's the basic issue. So if they don't acknowledge that there's a problem, then they're not going to do anything about it. And that's the biggest problem, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. And the reason that comes about, and th th this denialism is in general a big problem for all sorts of business leaders, not simply CEOs, but at all levels of the organizations, you know, from managers to solopreneurs, who, you know, people go bankrupt all the time. Small businesses go bankrupt all the time. Large businesses go bankrupt some of the time, but mm -hmm. often they really underperform. I mean, look at what happened with Wells Fargo with all the scandals around them, their staff writing out false bank accounts. And that was, has been going on for such a long time. You know, why didn't they realize this was going to happen? This was obviously going to be a big scandal, but a, yeah. they were denying reality, right? And this, so this happens at all levels. You, in all you know, sorts of situations. Well, you don't think that certain names like Wells Fargo, or what, you know, big names like that, you're, you're thinking that they're not going to have these major scandals go on. And I'm curious, why are they flinching? Why are they denying the truth? Why do they look away? Yes, yeah, so just kind of some of the stuff I talk about in my book, The Truth Seekers Handbook, a science-based guide. The essential reason, and we talked about some of this in the previous interview, mm -hmm. is emotions, how they feel about it. They feel bad about facing the truth. Mm -hmm. It goes against their intuitions, their gut reactions. You know, unfortunately, in our society, we're taught to listen to our guts. Often, this is bad advice. Sometimes it's good advice, often it's bad advice. In some cases, CEOs have this self-perception that they, uh, because they are very self-confident, they believe that they can't do anything wrong. <laughs> So yeah. therefore, any information coming to them about the organization's underperformance is inaccurate. Mm -hmm. They reject it out of hand. So they don't look at the external reality and change their mental model of reality. Instead, they impose their mental model of reality on external information. And that is a basic, basic problem that happens, again, for all sorts of business leaders and business professionals, from solopreneurs to CEOs. So it's it's more comfortable to have this in this lie than the inconvenient truth. And right. so how do we recognize that if it's a, a truth or a lie? I mean, it, how do we, if we have this self uh, preservation mechanism going on to protect us? Is that what's happening? Or 
Yes, yeah, so we have uh, an intuitive mechanism. Mm -hmm. We as human beings are not evolved for the modern environment. We have to recognize that. That's kind of the first basis of business success. But recognizing that we as human beings are not evolved for the modern environment, and therefore our brains are just going to make a number of errors in our intuitions and in our gut reactions when we face the modern environment. In situations that don't resemble the ancient savanna environment. So for example, in the savanna, we lived in small tribes where we knew people really intimately and well. So in that sort of environment, in our contemporary environment, we can read people who we know for a while pretty well, but we can't read strangers. We don't really react well to people who aren't like us. You know, and that's kind of some of the roots of complaints about racism, you know, ethnic problems, sexism, and so on in the workplace. These, these disparities, you know, that's why the harassments happen because of this tribal mentality. So if we recognize that, we can distance ourselves from it. We don't have to be the sort of naturalistic savages who just go with our guts. <laughs> we can be civilized people, but we have to recognize that intuitively we're not oriented to be civilized. We're oriented to be savage, you know, just like children are. We grow up, but we're not taught these things. We're not taught how to manage our minds and our thoughts in order to recognize reality and avoid believing comfortable lies over inconvenient truths. So you, you refer to this as thinking errors and how do we recognize, I mean, how do we know, uh, how do we avoid these thinking errors? I mean, is there a tip or tactic and what do we have to do to do that? So my book, The Truth Seekers Handbook has a chapter in it called Mental Maps. So the difference between our mental map of reality and the actual territory of reality. In the same way that a map is never actually representative of reality, yeah. it's always a representation of reality, it's not the actual reality. Mm -hmm. We have to remember always that our model of the world is never accurate. Humility is the first step. So this is one of the first tidbits when I do consulting and speaking mm -hmm. that I talk about with my clients this sense of humility. Mm -hmm. And that helps overcome the thinking error of overconfidence. Now, overconfidence is one of the basic fundamental thinking errors that we all tend to suffer from, especially more successful business leaders. So, but anyone, there was a study of college students that asked them, you know, hey, are you a below average driver, an average driver, or an above average driver? Well, the, the studies showed that 93% of college students consider themselves above average drivers. Mm -hmm. So 93%. And that's, you know, consider yeah. that they don't have much experience driving. They're college <laughs> students. <laughs> so, you know, they consider themselves above average drivers. Uh -huh. When people are asked, you know, how confident, when they're, when they're asked about the confidence of their answers in mm -hmm. certain questions, and they're said, you know, hey, I'm 99% confident that this is the accurate answer. There are studies that show they're wrong about 30 to 40% of the time. Now, imagine that, you know, 99% confidence, that's something that you're willing to bet your house on. Right. Imagine all your friends and, you know, 30% of them losing their house. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, that, that is not good odds. Right, right. And that's what happened in the 2008 fiscal crisis. You know, that's people lost their house because they were betting on the future and they were really overconfident, and so are many business leaders. So that first step of being humble about our mental map, recognizing, developing the mental habit of recognizing that our mental map of reality is never accurate, and that we're always going to be overconfident about the, our self-perceptions, that's the first step to understanding and addressing these thinking errors. Well, doesn't the overconfidence sometimes, like, isn't that why we have the Steve Jobs or had the Steve Jobs of the world? If he had tamed his self-confidence a little bit, would he have been as successful? And uh, do you think, what advice would you have given him to recognize what people thought of him? So if we think back to Steve Jobs, we'll remember that he was famously fired as the head of Apple. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> You know, clearly he was way too overconfident in that time and he tempered his overconfidence by the time he came back to Apple once again. Mm -hmm. So he learned some bitter life lessons from his excessive confidence about mm -hmm. how he should pursue uh, his activities. And he was actually more strategic going forward once he learned that lesson. Mm -hmm. Now, none of us 
should learn the lesson from Steve Jobs that you should be very, very confident. Yeah. We should learn the lesson that we shouldn't try to be super overconfident and then get fired from our position, right? right? <laughs> As some CEOs did. Uh-huh. You know, CEO, you know, Steve Jobs might have been one of the CEOs that Leadership IQ talked about, mm-hmm. the study talked about. So we don't want to be in that position. We want to be humble. And that humility is the first step that will allow us to see information that doesn't correspond with our mental map. And so that's the second step. When we see information that doesn't correspond with our mental map, we have to recognize that it doesn't do that. So people in our reality, in our society, don't tend to pay attention to information that's uncomfortable. And we have to develop a taste, a preference to learn information that's uncomfortable. If we're given any sort of constructive criticism, constructive feedback, then we have to pay double the attention to that constructive feedback as seems intuitive to us. We have to remember that our intuitions will lie to us about negative information, negative external information. And we have to pay especially careful and close attention to that information and see, pick out from that information, from that negative feedback, whatever is helpful. Now, you know, it doesn't mean that that negative information is accurate. So don't intuitively assume that it's accurate, but pay more attention to it than you would otherwise. Look at it, examine it carefully and closely and see what you can take from it in order to inform inform your activities going forward. So that's kind of the second step of dealing with this denial. Look at especially carefully at negative information and take from it what you can to go forward. How many steps are there and um, what, what do you do next? So after you to look at this external, look at this information, negative information. That's another aspect of this process. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you would want to do, and I talk about this in the Truth Seekers Handbook, a science-based guide, is to get an external perspective. Mm -hmm. So get somebody who you trust, someone who you trust, get their advice on how you're doing. And here, you don't want a yes man or yes woman. Mm -hmm. What you want is somebody who will be honest with you, somebody who will be frank with you, you know, who will give you some feedback that you may not be comfortable hearing. So this is something that I often do for leaders and organizations. I give them feedback on how they're doing in organizations because you know, nobody in the organization might be willing to give them frank, honest feedback. And that's you know, so bringing in somebody from the outside. Another way of doing this is if you're a leader in the organization is to ask a fellow leader in a similar organization to give you some feedback and return the favor to her in, in return for the feedback that you give. So do that for each other. That's another way of doing it. So getting that external perspective is really helpful, especially getting it from somebody who is pessimistic. So here we're going into some, into some another two types of biases. Optimism bias is a bias where people are excessively optimistic and risk-oriented. So they think everything will be good. They tend to pay less attention to risks than they should. And actually, research shows that most business leaders tend to be optimistic. So now, they, many people wouldn't go into leadership positions if they're not optimistic because you know, they won't think that they'll succeed. Right. So it's natural for people mm-hmm. who are in leadership positions to be optimistic. Unfortunately, they don't tend to look at all the other business leaders who didn't succeed, who yeah. failed. Uh-huh. So, you know, that's a big problem. You don't want to be in one of those positions of the CEOs who's being forced out, you know, or Steve Jobs after he was forced out of Apple the first time. So you don't want to be in that position. So look for somebody who is pessimistic, who is risk averse, and who will tell you, hey, these are the kind of problems that you're facing. These are the kinds of risks and who will actually give you that really helpful advice, that really helpful feedback that can hold your feet on the ground. uh, This is someone, often people in these positions rise to high levels if they have competent leaders who are in uh, the top level of leadership, who want a devil's advocate on their team. And that devil's advocate position, that devil's advocate person in your team is something to really be treasured because you will get frank and honest advice from her in a way that you wouldn't get from somebody who is a you know, yes woman, yes man. You don't want too many of those on your team. Well, you know, it's interesting because I had just recently met Wozniak and I've 
been, you know, I'm friends with people like Rich Kralgard had written a book about teams, you know, working better together. If the two, maybe certain people complement each other. And um, how do you know if you've got the right person to compliment you that maybe is the negative thing you need to hear? I mean, how do you recognize that person for you? That's if you have a lot of conflicts. <laughs> You know, so so you want to see if you're having a lot of conflicts and disagreements with that person, and if you are, you have the right person. <laughs> if you're if you're just agreeing all the time, again, this this has to do with our guts and, and intuitions. Uh -huh. huh. If that person is someone you're very comfortable with, and someone you're agreeing with all the time, and you perceive that person to be part of your tribe, part of your team, you're not really getting much from that person. Well, mm -hmm. what's that person bringing you? Why do you want another version of yourself uh -huh. if you're already bringing that? To your team you don't really need that you need someone who's different from you you need someone who brings a different perspective and that is really really valuable so if you have a number of if you see yourself disagreeing with that person having some conflicts having some tensions that's the right person to have on your team now in addition to having this person on the team you want to know how to manage these conflicts well and that's kind of a, a distinct topic of conversation mm -hmm. that's something i often do in teams help people manage conflicts so something that often happens when i go into teams in is that there are a number of optimists on the team and a number of pessimists and they have a lot of conflict with each other and they don't know how to resolve this conflict well mm -hmm. they just butt heads and they just right. know that you know things won't go well or yes things will go well you know mm -hmm. that doesn't help anyone right the best way the best meld of optimism and pessimism is for optimists to generate ideas about the future. Now, pessimists aren't really good at generating ideas about the future because their gut reactions shut those ideas down pretty quickly. Uh -huh. They're, they immediately see a lot of problems with them. So mm -hmm. during a brainstorming session, you know, they won't share many ideas because they're like, no, that's stupid. You know, I'm not going to share that. <laughs> so optimists are really great at generating a lot of ideas, mm -hmm. but they're not going to see the risks and the problems with these ideas. So pessimists are really great at pointing out the flaws with these ideas, and then optimists can generate solutions to the flaws, and that, that can be a repetitive cycle. So I often do that uh, in a team meeting, facilitating team meetings, with the optimists generating more ideas, pessimists pointing out flaws, so criticizing those ideas, and optimists generating solutions to these you know, problems. So this kind of, and again, you know, pointing out problems with these solutions by pessimists. Mm -hmm. And this is the best way of melding optimists and pessimists in a team setting. And these are just two types of characteristics that you want to mm -hmm. look out for, kind of thinking errors in team settings. Well, I'm curious, you know, how, how do you um, determine if you're not just arguing because the person's annoying or, or if they're actually helpful for, by being, you know what I mean? How do you mm -hmm. differentiate that this is actually a good person, I'm not butting heads with him because he's wrong or she's wrong or whatever. How do you know the difference? So I think you want to orient toward whether this person's feedback is helpful for the project. Mm -hmm. So whether this person's feedback is helpful can means that that person is not just attacking someone in ad hominem attacks, kind of just attacking someone's personality. Mm -hmm. If they are actually criticizing the project mm -hmm. and saying, or the idea and saying, hey, here are these flaws with this idea that I see. And that takes a lot of distancing for both parties, mm -hmm. for the person who created the ideas. So this is why, you know, it's really helpful to have someone, an outside facilitator or some kind of managerial level person who can facilitate this mm -hmm. for, to distance the optimist from the idea that she created and to, for the pessimist to criticize the idea and not criticize the person. So those are skills mm -hmm. that you can learn. Those right. are capacities that you can learn and that's a uh, healthy communication healthy conflict resolution those are all aspects of emotional and social intelligence that can be learned so you want to see whether the person is capable of learning that mm -hmm. i would say that that's probably the best way of evaluating whether that person is helpful mm -hmm. so is that person capable of learning those skills and deploying them effectively if not they probably shouldn't be on the team if they're not capable of learning and deploying those skills. Yeah, and how often 
do you run into the people that just point out all the problems, but then don't offer any solutions too? You don't, you want them to help with the offering of solutions if they're going to say, well, this isn't working, but maybe you should consider this or that, right? We want people to maybe offer solutions as well. Actually, no. Uh, no. Pessimists are not going to be very good at offering solutions for the reasons oh. I mentioned before, uh -huh. because they will immediately see a lot of problems with solutions. <laughs> yeah. And so that is not their forte. That's not their strong suit. So we yeah. want to use, we want to deploy people where they have their strengths. The optimists will tend to be the ones who will be best at offering solutions after pessimists point out the problems. That's what I tend to see in as good, healthy team dynamics. People who are using their strengths where they're well suited. So you don't want to, a pessimist to be generating new ideas or solutions because mm -hmm. they will, they're, our horizon is inherently limited. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad thing about them. Uh -huh. It's just that they are not really skilled at it. So you want the optimist the one, yeah. to be the one who is offering these solutions. It's, it's interesting what else they offer, though, to me. You know, I'm looking at this going, okay, you're hiring somebody to be the negative Nancy, basically. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the, we've always seen that as kind of a bad thing, but you're saying that this is a good thing. We need that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. we, you absolutely need that. So research by um, many people. Um, it's well summarized in Wisdom of the Crowds. I talk about it a little bit in uh, my book, The Truth Seekers Handbook, shows that teams really need a lot of diverse perspectives. Right. And you need to have somebody who's a devil, who is a devil's advocate, who points out all the flaws. Now, that doesn't mean that a solution has to be perfect in order to be carried out. You know, sometimes there's no perfect solution. Right. But you want to be aware of all the flaws before you proceed. So, you know, you probably don't want the devil's advocate person to be in the leadership position in the team. Right. But you want, you know, one or two of these people on the team to be able to point out the flaws and for them for the leader to decide whether it's wise to proceed in spite of the flaws. And the leader should have this um, position of having a mental understanding that their mental man doesn't reflect reality and being humble in order to really lead the team. Well. I want to see the resume of the pessimist to see, <laughs> you know, how you put on your categories of the things that you're good at. Do, yep. Is it good for somebody to put the negative, I'm a pessimist, that this is the things that I offer for you? I mean, I've seen people yeah. put that, uh, I've seen people put that on resumes and wise, effective leaders hire them. Huh. I would recommend that pessimists don't hold that back because it will still show in their work when they, when they yeah. come into the job. Uh -huh. You know, you, you don't want to say, you know, I'm a negative Nancy. That's not the thing you want to do. <laughs> right. You'll say, uh, my skills are at looking for ways to Critically. improve current uh -huh. processes and looking for ways that current processes don't work very well and pointing out opportunities for improvement. So it's kind of the, you know, the nice way of framing <laughs> pessimism. So, uh -huh. yes, the, uh, so the, that's the kind of wording that I would recommend that people put on their resumes and I've seen put on resumes that uh, succeeds in getting them hired by organizations that know that they need these sorts of people on the team and encourage this sort of thinking. Do you recommend they attend masterminds to be around peers uh, and share things that work? I mean, how do you feel about masterminds and levels oh. of getting together with groups like that? I feel great about masterminds. I think masterminds are really helpful mm -hmm. and other sorts of circles where you can be with people who are like you. So, you know, pessimists can learn from each other mm -hmm. how to effectively communicate opportunities for improvement. So it's wise for pessimists to learn how to effectively convey to their peers mm -hmm. that they're criticizing the idea, they're not criticizing the person. And they're not doing it because they want to break down the idea. They're doing it because they want to improve it and make sure that it works, mm -hmm. make sure that any solution that's offered is going to be the, a really solid one. So communicating that will be really helpful. And there are specific techniques and strategies that you can use based on emotional and social intelligence to communicate these things effectively. So to convey yourself as a collaborator to mm -hmm. the whole project. How did you get involved in all these thinking-based things? I mean, you and I have talked about this in the past, you know, emotional intelligence, social intelligence, and now thinking errors. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I'm writing a book about uh, curiosity. So I'm fascinated in what you're doing. And uh, how did you get to be a thinking guy? And give me your perspective on curiosity. I'd love to hear what you think about how we can develop it or if, were you a curious kid? <laughs> I was a very curious kid. So I guess my desire to address this issue came for actually from my childhood where I saw people around me, including my parents, and uh, people in my town, my family, make a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. uh, and have unnecessary conflicts, mm -hmm. shouting with each other, just bad stuff. I, I mean, then I grew up, I saw businesses around me making bad decisions, politicians, and so on. And so I wanted to study, you know, why do groups, organizations, leaders make really bad decisions that have really negative outcomes? Mm -hmm. You know, you can kind of look, uh, uh, we use the example of Wells Fargo. I mean, looking back in hindsight, it seems obvious mm -hmm. that this would happen. You know, this can't stay silent. Right, <laughs> this would right. obviously happen. Right. But how come all those people who are paid millions and millions and millions of dollars didn't realize this, <laughs> that this would happen? You know, why didn't they do that? Mm -hmm. So th it seems obvious in hindsight. So mm -hmm. as a kid, I, you know, I was a teenager, I wanted to study this. So I went into the history of behavioral science which is the topic of my research. And that allows me to combine behavioral science with psychology, with political science, with economics, and a lot of other fields to look at how groups and institutions make decisions. I was interested not in simply in business, uh, business but also politics and civic organizations and so on. So that's what I studied. And uh, yeah, that's kind of my background. That's, and I started doing consulting and civic activities after I was a went into graduate school, and then became a professor. So that's a little bit of my narrative. Well, you got out pretty early then. You've been doing this for a while, haven't you? Oh, yes. Yeah, I've been doing this. I've been doing speaking for about 20 years, and I've been doing consulting for just under a decade. So. Mm -hmm. Well, you look so young, so I think. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm wondering. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, well, you do. And you you and I have talked that, you, you know, you're at Ohio State, and my husband went to Ohio State. And what do you teach there now? The history of behavioral science, so these sorts of related courses. Oh, and you asked about curiosity. So curiosity mm -hmm. is a very important skill, and that's mm -hmm. um, something I was pointing to when I said that you want to be learn to appreciate negative information. Mm -hmm. That's an aspect of curiosity, kind of right. to uh, invest more attention, more emotional awareness into negative information as well as positive mm -hmm. you know, positive inf curiosity encompasses positive information mm -hmm. but you want to be especially curious about negative information about negative stimuli that feels intuitive because otherwise you'll ignore them you won't be curious about them you'll just mm -hmm. shunt them aside mm -hmm. because it doesn't fit your mental map of reality right, right so that takes again so that that sort of curiosity takes a lot of humility to notice negative information and to be humble, recognizing that you're going to make, that your mental map of the world is not going to be perfect, and to have a strong desire to correct it, to improve it, which takes, again, curiosity, being curious about where your mental map of the world is broken, is mistaken. You know, where, do, where does it have, you know, here be dragons? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and uh, change that and address it and improve it based on those external stimuli. How do you help people to become more curious? I mean, that's a tough one, I think. Does it have to come down, so, do you think? No, I don't think so. I think the way you want to help them be more curious is as with any sort of quality, you want to motivate them. Mm -hmm. So you've got to figure out what motivates people. Mm -hmm. When I talk to business leaders about uh, how, and you know, they, it takes effort to learn these skills, this mental map, being mm -hmm. humble, not being in denial, and how do you motivate them? Well, you mm -hmm. motivate them by saying, look, this, will, this is what will happen mm -hmm. you know, to Wells Fargo, and this is what, what will happen to you know, many other examples mm -hmm. right. of you know, ordinary people who lost their house, uh, went underwater after 2008, mm -hmm. so many businesses that you know, also crashed at that time. Right. This is what will happen to you if you don't take these steps. Mm -hmm. So you got, you got to motivate them, and you got to show why it's valuable for them to be curious and for them to learn strategic thinking, to be a truth seeker, which is what I've, I wrote my book about, mm -hmm. you, they need to see the value to themselves. Mm -hmm. And only after they see the value to themselves will they start to develop these mental habits. Mm -hmm. And we have to be clear, these are mental habits. Mm -hmm. Habits, you know, 
just like people learned to see the value to themselves of doing things like brushing their teeth and flossing, mm -hmm. you know, or, uh, you know, men learn to put on uh, ties to impress others and women put on makeup and so on, kind of very basic things mm -hmm. that we learn. And we don't think of them as habits, but they are habits. Right. That's habits. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn the same mental habits as well. The mm -hmm. mental habits of curiosity, the mental habits of humility and tamping down one's confidence mm -hmm. and learning to welcome the devil's advocate into your team, yeah. <laughs> even if you don't, even if it doesn't intuitively feel emotionally comfortable to you. Mm -hmm. These are all mental habits mm -hmm. and we have to learn them and appreciate them. And in order to learn them, we have to be motivated by a certain outcome. So that's the motivation that, that I'm speaking about that people need to have. Well, so this, your class would be fascinating to take. I'm sure a lot of people want to know more about uh, what you do, how they get your books, how they can find out more. So can you share your sites with everybody? Because I, I know you've been on my show before. You can listen to that on um, the, my, my site on drdianehamiltonradio.com. But how do you uh, find out more about yours? Sure. So people can go to my personal website, glebtsipursky.com again that's g-l-e-b-t-s-i-p-u-r-s-k-y.com or disasteravoidanceexpert.com which will take them to it so again that's disasteravoidanceexpert.com and that has more information about me my books my speaking my consulting and they can find the, my book the truth seekers handbook a science-based guide on amazon so it's available there again the, the truth seekers handbook a science-based guide folks can get it from amazon well, thank you, Vlad, and you said your last name a lot better than I said it. And <laughs> <laughs> maybe after two or three more interviews, I'll get this one right. Perfect. Sounds good. <laughs> so nice to have you on the show, and it's a pleasure, uh, Diane, as always. Oh, it, and we will do this again. Absolutely. <laughs>